right, uh, training man's back again for a um, supplemental or a uh, follow-up to my four-part series on painting a locomotive. Now, I thought I'd put this side up. <laughs> you see the other side all the time. And uh, it just came out absolutely perfect. Um, I'm quite pleased with the coloring. And uh, you can see in the picture, this is black. That's green. Smoke box turns out a little light in the picture, but it's actually a darker gray. It's the lighting in here and fluorescent lights. Things change with fluorescent lights, believe me. Uh, I got to do some little work, a little bit of work on the uh, on the numbers. They're not quite up to my standards, but I'll get it. I have to work on them a little bit, and I'm still working on the pump. Um, I got the head off. I made the valve. It didn't make any difference. The valve. It still didn't work right. I, I think I'm getting a drag off the O-rings. And I'm going to attempt to use the square section O-ring. I'm going to go get some of those and replace the O-rings with that. Um, it's almost essential to have good lubrication. We're going off the subject, but the subject of this video is the colors of the Pennsylvania Railroad. Well, where did I get them? Well, here's where I got them from. Right here. These things are called, I couldn't remember the name of them, they're called drift cards, and I found them. I have a set here, this is a locomotive set, and there's other sets they have, I saw them on eBay, they got one's 250 bucks for them now, I don't know why they want so much money for them, I think they're available from the Historic Society, uh, and uh, you know, maybe I can put that up on the screen. I don't know if I can find the, the actual site, but it's the Pennsylvania Railroad Historic Society uh, where I got these a long time ago, and the, the fellow's name was Irving something, and I can't remember his name. Uh, I'll try to find it for you. I was looking last night. I couldn't find it. But uh, he also sent me a page, which I also can't find. I'll, I'll, I'll look for it. I moved, so when you move, you know, things get... Uh, and it told about what colors were where and what and how was how was it colored. But also in that in those bulletins, it tells you about the marker lights, where they were placed, and so on, the colors of the colors. And that's where I got all of this information from. I didn't just know it. I never heard of it before. And like I told you before, we have the the um, ability to be able to Google if you will, these things to get them off the internet. The internet tool, instead of playing games with it and looking at other stuff on air and Facebook and who's, who's uh, bitching about this and that and all this other stuff, it's really a, a learning tool. And hopefully that's some of my videos do that for people. But anyway, let's talk about this. Okay, dark green locomotive enamel. I'm going to show each one up front, each one separately. There it is. Okay. Now, inside, that was called a drift card, which is a piece of paper with the color on it. Now, you can see that, a little greenish in there. Now, this is a gloss, so when I put it up against here, it's going to look different. Now, I don't, I don't like... I don't like the gloss. I like the flat. I think it looks more realistic. That's the dark green locomotive enamel. That's the color the locomotives were. Okay, and I don't know why they put them in black. It must be to protect them. Okay, we're going to do synthetic buff. John Hudak, you want to know what color it is? It's called synthetic buff. There it is. Synthetic Buff, and here's the color. Right, now I'm going to put this up against the yellow, which is the yellow, same yellow they use on it. It's called Camp Car Yellow Paint. Camp Car Yellow Paint. This is what they use for around the, um, on the handrails, on, on some of the cars, like the caboose and so on, and around the number board here. Around, around the number plate, and this is yellow. And I'll bring that. I'll bring the other one up against it so you can see it. But 
You can see it's more yellow than this one. So now you can see the contrast in the colors. Now, how do you get these colors? Well, John, what I did, what I did was I took reefer yellow, reefer yellow, and I took a, a color called burnt umber, and I mixed that in. Somebody, some artist guy told me, oh, you want to change the color of something, darken it, you use burnt umber. So I got some burnt umber pigment. I can put it in there. Now, maybe brown would work. It's a dark brown. Maybe get a dark brown and invest in a little tweezer. Uh, not tweezers, an eyedropper, a good one. Not a, a, if you can get a glass one, it's the best with a good rubber seal because the solvents of the paint will destroy it. So you got to get a good one. I got mine from Mark, Micromark, I believe, a long time ago. Anyway, you tuck something and you carefully drop one, two, mix it up, what it looks like, okay? Maybe another drop three, mix it up. Uh, now it's starting to look right. Okay, so you remember that's three drops to a full bottle of uh, reefer yellow. Now I've been using Floquil, which you can't get anymore, but anyway, okay, now Toledine Red. Toledine, Toledine, whatever. Toledine Red. Enamel, always enamel. See, so on the back here, on this one, tells you information about it. You can stop the screen and look at it. Note, color panels should be kept in an envelope when not in use for color comparison. So you, you, you keep it in there for a reason. Now, this is, this is the color. It's an orangey red, and that matches. There, I don't know if you can see that. Let's see. I can see it inside. Yeah, you can see it. Barely, but that's that's what color the windows are, the window frames, and the center of the keystone. The outside of the keystone, the border, and the numbers are camp car yellow, or it's like a yellowish color. Um, uh, reefer yellow, flow quill reefer yellow is pretty close to the right color. Then I have color called freight car paint red freight car paint and here's the color now you want to use oxide it's oxide red which is a primer really not right because remember what's something about primer it's 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 a uh, it's porous. It's porous. So here is Tuscan red we're going to have next. Well, I have Tuscan because that's the color I have. And here it is. You don't want to see through that. It says on the back. These are the official paint swatches, drift cards, or whatever they call them. And they have others. They have There's a set, probably a 15, the full set. I don't have the full set. Didn't need it. Uh, modelers use that. They have the, the colors of the buildings, uh, so and so. Oh, by the way, if you ever see the, the station signs, <coughs> the station signs with the long station and with the little keystone in the middle, well, those signs were exactly the same colors as the number plate. Uh, looked at that one. Tall line, synthetic buff coloring. That yeah, says on the back, January 54. That's when they, they used that. And it tells you here, uh, re, re, it, these are reprint. It says right on here, reprint it. By the Pennsylvania Railroad Technical and Historic Society. So that's where you get these from. The Pennsylvania Railroad Technical and Historic Society. And I'll try to get that site for you and the information. I'll post it on here on the site. So that's where the colors come from. You want to guess at the colors? Well, go right ahead. You're absolutely free. 
person to do whatever you want. Personally, I don't think so. And uh, it, these numbers, you know, these reference numbers, I don't know what they mean. Uh, it might be the reference number to the uh, a paint um, uh, formula. I don't know. Now, the paint formula, I don't know where that is. You can probably get it. I really didn't need it. I just was able to get these and match as close as I could to the colors. And quite frankly, I get as close as I can. Who's going to who's gonna doubt me? And if they did, who cares? I'll get as close as I can. It's better than anybody else I've ever seen. They're painting them hunter green and everything else. Hunter green is not the color. Dark green locomotive enamel, that color. And here's the back side. It says 52. This is October 52. So this was the color probably that a lot of the diesels were built, uh, painted in. But the steam engines were too. They didn't really change it. The GG1s, of course. And it's got the number on there. Uh, oh, it's got two different numbers. I wonder why. It's got a reference number 47 2247 and 47 2626. I have no idea what that means. Um, probably some kind of paint, paint codes. Uh, but these are the official, and you can buy these from the. I believe you still can get them. <coughs> Technical Historic Society. Okay, well, uh, about ready to bring her up to the club now. I was going to do it this weekend, but it's going to rain, and I now have a pickup truck rather than a van. I had a van before, and quite honestly. Pickup trucks have their place. Uh, my opinion is they're only good for carrying horse poop and hay. With a van, um, I can put the locomotive in the van today, tomorrow, whenever I get a chance to get somebody to help me and lock it up and keep it there. When we first started running this, we didn't have a place to put it at the uh, PLS, so I kept it in the van all summer. I never removed it from the van, and we just every couple of weeks or three weeks we would go up and run it. And uh, until I got a place up there. <coughs> oh, man, it's cold. Still hanging on, man. Still one of the worst colds I've had. Uh, anyway, uh, the K4-1361 is looking awesome. I just, um, I just uh, uh, joined a site, Fans of the 1361, which... I hope those guys are going to start doing something with that locomotive. I'm not a big fan of this T1 Trust. Um, yeah, okay, it's a cool locomotive. If it was so cool, why didn't the PRR keep one? They didn't. They didn't keep any of their big engines. They didn't keep any of the J's because it wasn't their design. The Q's, they didn't keep any of these engines. They just kept the classic ones. I think the biggest they had was the Mountain. The 482, that's out of Strasbourg, 50, 66, 67, 55, I think the number is. And uh, I hope they do something. And then again, they have two K4s, 3750 and this one, uh, 1361. Now, the guy posted, the fellow there that's the curator, or the moderator, or whatever they call him, the, he, they redid the headlight. So I, I took a picture. I had pictures of my headlight, and I put it on there. I said, well, this is my version of it. And you look at the original headlight, and then you look at this one. <laughs> they're pretty much exactly the same. I had the drawing. Of course, I made it. It was hard to make that thing. Everybody asked me, can you make that thing? Can you make one? Nobody really likes the modern look. I'm about the one of the few people. Uh, one of the club members, uh, 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 a um, respected club member of the PLS uh, William Normart, Bill Normart. Uh, I had a lot of respect for the man. He was a good modeler, nice, quiet guy, um, no, very knowledgeable. He's an a artist. Uh, he was a uh, architectural, he did architectural renders. Like if you were to build a house, he would draw a picture. Um, he also did a lot of railroad stuff around the PLS club, uh, buildings and whatnot. He says, you built a beautiful, quote, unquote, I'll try to get it close. You built a beautiful locomotive, Dave, but you built the wrong pilot. You built the wrong one. And he was saying how ugly this pilot is and all that. Well, back in his day, you know, he was 90-something when he died a few months ago, about a month ago. Well, 
To him, the classic chicken coop pilot and the headlight mounted here and all of that was his way of seeing the K4. Me, in the 50s, 57, 56, 55, I was, you know, 7, 8, 9. Um, my dad and my cousin Dick, we go to uh, Shark River Inlet to go fishing. And, you know, if you're fishing on the bank, you're close to the bank, you got to get out into the channel a little bit more. So we would walk out on the railroad trestle that was right there before the... Uh, there was, a, there was a bridge, the Shark River Inlet Bridge, and then there was another little inlet which we used to fish, and there was a, like a wooden trestle there. I'm, might be still there as far as I know, probably. And over to the side, there was a, like a bank that we'd fish off of, but also there was a road up there. I forget the, the road that went into, into, down to the, to the ocean. And uh, we would be fishing there, and of course the, the power lines or the telephone line, and phew, hundred lines, you know, with the, the old-time T-cross on them with the little insulators. And uh, we look, and you see the bridge going down, and you hear the whistle. And my fat dad would say, okay, come on, Dick, come on, David, we got to go. Train's coming. So we go over to the side, stand over the side, this thing would come down, clung, 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 boom, blowing a whistle for the railroad crossing. And it was this guy, 1361. So that's why I remember it. I remember with this pilot and the headlight and all of that. That's how I remember. Dirty, always, always not shiny, always dirty, coal, filled with coal. They didn't care. They were ready, they were ready to scrap them. But the 1361, which is Eastern Division, and over here it says C, C T E, Camden, Camden Terminal Engine. That's what that stands for. They were all based out of Camden, but they ran on the New York and Long Branch, along with the Jersey Central. Now, uh, I'm more than likely sure that Jersey Central diesels came through there, the double enders came through there, the Baldwin Babyface double enders, which was only six in the entire world that they made, and uh, other, other locomotives, train masters coming through there. Um, and I don't remember any of that, but I do remember the steering. How can you forget that? Woo, boo, blow a whistle, loud as a son of a gun. I remember that. That made a real strong impression on, on me 60 years ago. So, uh, 61 years ago, I guess, right? 61, yeah, well, today's 18, yeah, 61, 62 years, 63 years ago. And uh, that's how I remember them, so that's what I built. Uh, everybody builds the locomotive that they remember. This is what I remember. This is what I remember, guys. Now, this pilot here, oh, man, what a job that was to build that. that, that one of my friends, he had a K-40. He said, hey, Dave, he says, do you think I can borrow your pilot? Look at this. This is what crazy people. Uh, borrow your pilot so I can make a copy? I said, are you out of your mind? You know how long it would take? I couldn't get it off of there for one thing. It would, I could get it off, but you just don't bolt it on and take it off. And you're going to make a copy. I said, yeah, make a copy. You know how hard that was to make? I'm telling you, it took me three months to make that. Every day working on it, it's all metal. It had to be shaped and bent and beat. Now, the prototype, uh, another myth, we use the word myth, that they were cast steel pilots. Yes and no. The centerpiece right here, right in this area right here, was a casting. The two outside pieces were steel, about a half inch thick, that were bent around here like this and formed, just like they do the, they put them in the boiler shop probably, bent them. And the reason being is, if you look at some K4 pictures, you'll see two lines going down here where they welded it. And some of the pretty sloppy chewing gum weld, I call it, because you know, it looks like you take chewing gum and stick it on. Well, that was done that way because if they were to ding that side, they just cut it there, take it apart, and put another piece in there. That was their idea of making it. I guess it was easier to make it that way. And, of course, the center the drop coupler. Now, this works like the prototype. Works just like the prototype. This slides back. Slides back out of the way. And the coupler goes down. Why, why isn't it going now? And then it comes back up. And you push this back in. And that slide locks it in. And there you go. There you go. Works just like the prototype. Of course, now I don't have a uh, counterweight. They were actually counterweight, so one man could 
actually pick it up. And I have the whole thing in there, but I didn't add the counterweight pocket where they would put either lead or sand. There was a big pocket there, and they would fill it up uh, to, to get the weight just right. But I didn't do any of that because I figured I was going to be picking it up with my finger anyway. But uh, that's the cutting levers. It was that was quite a bit of a job to make that. I had the original drawings. I went to the archives. Now, where do you get the drawings, Dave? Can I have this drawing? Look, they're all available. You have to go to the archives. I'm fortunate enough to live only uh, two hours away. I go there. I make a, There's a fellow named Kurt Bell there. I contact him, and I tell him what I'm looking for. And I go there, and you got to wear gloves and all this stuff. And you look through all of these print, prints and prints, and they bring out these boxes and boxes, and you're looking and you're looking. And they allow you to take pictures as long as you don't use a flash. So I took some pictures of the stuff. Actually, I got the drawings. What, what I, uh, the, the Pensy, perfect example. I don't know if other railroads have this, but they had document. Everything that they ever did was documented, and it's all out there if you could find it. The big problem was whoever did the documentation stuff, they didn't leave spaces in between, like they use your X number, X, but da, 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 da. And then the next one, the next one, the next one. They didn't leave spaces in between to put any revision prints in there. So the numbers are all over the world, all different kinds of numbers. They're everywhere. So you can't find, uh, you have to know what you're looking for. So now I got, oh, wait, there it is. Assembly drawing, balloons going everywhere. Part number so-and-so, part this, part that. Drawing number this, drawing number that, boom, bang, boom, boom, on all directions. I got that drawing. I said, okay, ma'am, this is like gold. I said, give me this drawing. I wrote them all down. I said, these are the drawings I want. She went to the computer, found out where they are, come, brought them all out. Oh, I had the drawings for every single piece, and I made the parts. I drew them up on CAD. In the back of here, there's two pieces of steel that are shaped, and I, I wanted those on there in case I hit something, boom, you know. And, of course, look, I'm way, way higher than scale here. That should probably be half that. But you got to remember, you want that higher than, you always want this portion right here higher than the rail. You want to be at least three-quarters or an inch high. But I made it so that this would slide along the rail. It's strong back there. It's a good heavy-duty quarter-inch piece of steel back there. And I hope that I never have to damage that. But I built it, and quite honestly, used a lot of bongo. Bondo, bondo, right on there. Bongo, bongo, as John Smith used to call it. Okay, well, um, that really now concludes, this is going to be part five supplement. Uh, that really concludes the painting of a locomotive, and in particular, this video was uh, an informative video for Pensy, Pennsylvania Railroad Locomotives, the standard railroad of the world. Um, so I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I always wanted to make this particular video. And uh, thanks for watching. Please subscribe, and we'll see you again on the next video.